The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the son of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God's breathe and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We have begun a study of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. In our Corinthian study, we have been looking at spiritual gifts, and we are in um, chapter uh, 14. Well, actually, we're going into chapter 15, but we're ending the spiritual gift section is chapter 14. Now, I'm not going to spend too much more time on uh, uh, the temporal gift, spiritual gift, or uh, uh, the interpretation of tongue, um, because I'm sure that this doctrine uh, causes offense. What I mean by that is that some of us have had personal experiences with the gift of tongues. In other words, we have been in um, church circles and denominations where individual uh, spoken uh, so-called tongues. And last week, I know it may sound like I make fun of uh, the charismatic uh, movement. I don't necessarily make fun of the people in themselves, but I seek to deter people away from doctrine that is not consistent well, what the word of God clearly teach. You know, the Bible has the final authority in all matters of faith, practice, and experience. Speaking in tongue is a experience, but depending on what time period, it may not be a biblical experience or experience that lines up with the word of God. Now, it's very clear in Acts chapter 2, that tongue was a language. It was not the language of the, the person who spoke. They did not even understand. The apostle did not even understand what they were saying because it wasn't their language. But the people that heard them knew what they were saying. And what they were saying always glorified God. People can understand it. Is that the tongue that we... See today, actually, when I was before I got, you know, strong in the word, I was sitting in a church one day, and uh, and all of a sudden, the pastor said something, and the lady next to me, I'm not going to speak in tongue, by the way, today I'm not going to speak in tongue today, y'all, <laughs> but the person next to me began to speak in tongue, and me being a, a uneducated believer at the time, I didn't know much of the word. I'm going to be honest with you. I wanted to get up and run out of there. Because <laughs> I could, I thought, I, I couldn't even understand, you know, what she was saying. I didn't know what that was. And then all of a sudden, she got up. She did a couple laps around the, the room. <laughs> and then, you know, everybody was looking at it like it was normal. But I, had, I was looking at it like she had no lost her mind. I said, what is going on in this place? I'm out of here. And so... We saw last week that if there is no one in the church to interpret what the person was saying for edification, they were to remain silent. So that is not the same thing that is going on in the, and I actually be honest with you, the gift of tongue, the movement started in uh, uh, Topeka, Kansas. That's where it started at. But because of personal experience, lack of understanding of the whole realm of God's word. And uh, because maybe your great, great grandmama or your auntie or cousin uh, uh, spoke in tongues and you don't want to offend them by standing on the truth of the word, that tongue at some point will cease when God have accomplished his plan for tongue, just like prophecy would see once the word of God is complete. You don't have no need of nobody saying, thus says the Lord if the word of God is already completed. 
what God wants us to know, he wants us to know by going to the scripture. And so, but people can read in, um, in, in 1 Corinthians, they could read when they say tongue would cease and still think that tongue still exists. They can read prophecy would cease and still come away with that we do have New Testament prophets walking around. We uh, and, and 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 New Testament prophets. I mean uh, apostles. No, you don't. We don't have true, real apostles around today. Not in a biblical sense. You know, you may have people walking around carrying the badge of apostle, but I see through all that. In other words, the only reason the person wear the badge of apostle because it's all about money. It's all about money and influence. It's about money and it's about influence. And when you they want when they walk in the room and say I'm an apostle so and so they want you to bow down, and and then after you notice that after they said they're apostle so and so now it's time to take up offering. <laughs> then they pass the offering plate and they'll pass it around one time and then they'll send the deacons back to the back to count and see how much they got, and then they'll see that they haven't reached their target and then they'll create donor funds and building funds at this fund and say, God said that there's a hundred people in the room that's going to donate $500. This is your year for blessing. And, and if you don't uh, uh, give God $500, then they go to Malachi and say, you're robbing God and God is going to curse you. And so people get motivated by fear and they just give all their money. Then the next day, their light, lights are turned off and they're calling the church, as for money to buy food for their family. That is not the will of God. But their lack of understanding. Then when you come preaching against that type of stuff, they want to get offensive at you and want to throw stones at you. I'm just trying to keep, I'm trying to help you keep your lights on. <laughs> I'm trying to help you provide for your family by telling you that these people are out for money. They are, they're only looking to get, they're trying to make themselves look spiritual so that they can rob you. We got to get in the habit of taking the word of God for what it say, literally. And not many believers have a habit of doing that. What I wanted to do today, I want to take you, first of all, before we go to chapter 15, because I'm going to get away from tongues, because I don't want to be tempted to speak in tongues, okay? I don't speak in tongues. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But uh, before we move forward to chapter 15, I want to do something today. Go to 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I want to encourage and challenge you guys today. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 and 17 of second Timothy three reads, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now here, Paul, who is the author, writing to the young pastor Timothy, say all scripture is inspired by God. Now all here is a reference to the Old Testament. Because the new uh, the the Bible haven't yet been completed when he was writing this, and so all is a reference to the Old Testament. But to us today, all is the Old and New Testament in its original is inspired. Now this word inspired means that God spoke to the minds of the writers of the Bible, told them what they're to speak. And the Holy Spirit was there making sure that they only wrote what God wanted us to know. That's why the word of God is inspired. And it is profitable, but it was for our benefit. It was for our benefits. So the word of God is God's very word for our benefit. The word useful or profitable mean useful. And there's four 
usefulness of the Bible. I want to give you four usefulness of the Bible. The first usefulness of the Bible, or all of God's word, it is useful for teaching. Now, teaching here is a reference to doctrine. The word of God gives us healthy Bible teaching. It tells us what we are to believe. The Bible tells us what we're to believe. So anything that is contrary to what's in the Bible, we're not to believe it. It's not sound doctrine. It's not correct doctrine. Another uh, benefit of the Bible, it, it is good for reproof. Reproof is, is convicts us of sin and error. The word of God convicts us of sin and error. And that's why if, if, if you're holding to a, a doctrine that is not biblical, or even, even if you sin, and that goes for me too, the more I read the word of God, the word of God shines light on sin in my life. It convicts me. And it also shows me when I have brought false teaching into my life. You know, a, a lot of us come from different backgrounds, different denomination, religion. And I remember when I started really growing in the word, man, I had to unlearn a lot of things that I had brought into the Christian life from my great grandma church. <laughs> so I tell people that when you start learning in a church that want to stick with what the Bible teaches, get ready to unlearn and relearn. I tell the leaders that I meet with uh, on every week that get ready to unlearn and relearn because we're going to look at the proper rules for interpreting the Bible. You're going to find out that some of the things you used to believe wasn't correct belief. And some of the things that you thought was okay was not is not okay. But only the word of God can show us that. And if we stay away from the word of God, we will have wrong doctrine. And we will also think we're okay when we're living in sin and we'll be holding on to doctrine that is error. And then another usefulness of the Bible, it, it, it corrects. It corrects. Now, correcting here means it disclose, the Bible will disclose wrong behavior. The Bible will sh show us, do not do this. Do not do this. Do not do this. So it disclosed wrong behavior. Some people, when you teach the Bible, they get off and like, I didn't say that. I didn't say wives submit to your husband. That's not even my words. And if you're not putting yourself under the leadership of your husband, don't attack me. I didn't say it. I didn't even wrote it. I didn't even aspire to be written. <laughs> The same way, if the Bible says, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church, humble yourself and love your wife as Christ loved the church. And if you're not doing it, the Bible will disclose that your behavior is wrong. And actually, there's great blessing when we just humble ourselves and put ourselves under God's authority. But like we learned earlier, is when we don't obey we're, put, we're, we're exalting ourselves as the authority above God, and that's pride, and that leads to disaster in marriage. And then the Bible, another benefit of the Bible is it is useful for training in righteousness. In other words, it develops right behavior. The word of God develops right behavior. Now, I want you to notice something. The first two benefits of the Bible, teaching, rebuking, has everything to do with what we believe. The next two, correcting and training, have everything to do with how we behave. So in other words, the Bible is useful for correct belief and correct behavior. And without it, you have not the correct belief and your behavior is not gonna be as it should. Now, what is the purpose of the Bible? If you look at verse 17, it says, so that. The word so that here is the Greek word henna. And henna, henna speaks of purpose and result. So the result of the Bible 
is so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped, that he may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, that he may be prepared and mature and also complete. So the Bible is the only way we can be equipped as men and women of God who have correct belief and correct behavior. And it's the only message that has the power to deliver people and change lives. It is not my opinion that changed lives. Sometimes when people don't know the Bible, they think that what you're saying is your opinion. That's why it's important to study the Bible. And the more you study the Bible, you're going to just unify us because we're going to see what God has to say and not what man has to say. It's the only message that leads to salvation. It's the only message that chain line. It's the only message that leads to spiritual maturity. Now speaking, I want to uh, speak about the authority of God, word, the Bible. This here, this Bible you hold, have the right and the power to do three things. The Bible has the right and the power to do three things. One, it has the right to set forth trustworthy, dependable, objective standard of truth by which to measure everything else. In other words, the Bible is the authority. And we're to measure everything we hear based on what the word of God teaches. But a lot of time what we do is we listen to these professors and these doctors and our unsaved friends or friends out of fellowship or this person, that person. And we measure what is true based on what everybody else is saying rather than what does the Bible say? Second, the Bible has the right to determine the right belief and determine correct behavior for all men, including the church. The president do not have the authority to tell the, the authority to tell us what is right belief and right behavior. God's word have the authority to tell what is right behavior, right belief. We don't have the authority to determine what is right behavior, right belief. God's word has the right to determine what is correct behavior and correct belief. But that is not how a lot of us operate in our everyday life. You know, we look at, like, for example, um, I like to sit, talk about things that everybody can relate, but I'm not to base um, God's will for marriage based on me being happy. Marriage was not designed to make none of us happy. I didn't mean to bust in by the bubble. <laughs> but <laughs> it was not designed to make anybody happy. You know what it was designed to do? to make us holy, to set us apart from sin, from ourselves, so that we can glorify God and be a blessing to somebody else. But people say, well, and you have people tell people that if you're not happy, get a divorce. Well, now they become the authority. Nowhere in the scripture can you find that text right there that they just spoke the text don't say that the text don't say if you're unhappy get a divorce but people believe that they believe that's the ground for divorce is just being unhappy well maybe you're unhappy because it's all about you it's not about god it's not about you know uh serving the other person i tell people if you spend more time serving the other, other person you'll find yourself happy and content. For me, I get more joy out of serving others than serving myself. That's a miserable life, serving self. <laughs> what a miserable life. And some people say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna give 50-50. If he give 50, I'm gonna give 52. Okay, with that attitude, that's a 50% chance that y'all gonna last after the hell of it. After the honeymoon, he gonna want to get a divorce because it's not gonna be always. Sometimes you're gonna be given a hundred percent, and that person is gonna be given ten. 
Uh, not even 10. It was 100%. He got to be given nothing. <laughs> but, but you're to glorify God and you're to do everything in service to God. I submit to my husband because God commands me to submit. And because I love him, I'm going to obey and submit even when he's not doing, giving 100%. God know how to deal with knucklehead. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to take battles in your own hand. Ask, ask Jonah. Jonah will tell you about it. How you deal with, see, Jonah, if he could have, he ran from doing God's will. And you know what God did? He provided him transportation. <laughs> he provided him a caravan. And guess what? When God got through with him, I guarantee you better go preach the gospel to the to 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 the unbelievers after that experience. Can you imagine being in the belly of a fish and you don't know, you know, what your life has become? But if you don't want to do God's will, he has a way of motivating our wills. He has a way of doing it. And then third, the Bible gives the only reliable source of information about God and how to live the spiritual life. So in other words, God's word is above all of our tradition, all of our doctrines, all of our philosophies, all of our opinions, all of our tradition, all of our cultural practices. I have people all the time tell me, well, we don't do that in our culture, okay? That don't mean that it's right just because that's a cultural practice. It's not wrong either, unless it does not line up with what it work. But some people try to put their cultural practice above what the Bible teaches. And I just want to encourage y'all with this. Don't defend a doctrine, a practice, or a spirit, or a cultural practice or tradition without knowing what the Bible says about it. But people will like dogmatically defend a doctrine without even learning patiently what the word of God says about it. Rule number one, I'm going to give y'all one rule to interpret in the Bible. If you want to be a real interpreter of the Bible, rule, rule number one for interpreting the Bible is, Grant, what is it? Interpret, rule number one for interpreting the Bible. Interpret. Literally, literally. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> interpret literally. When you read an author's book, when you read an author's book, how many of y'all Read into the author's word something that he didn't even say. None of us do that. When we come to the Bible, we just have a totally different approach to the Bible. We read into the Bible something that is not even there. I can ask everybody in here, how many, uh, how many wise men came and presented gifts to Jesus? Half of the room goes say, oh, it was three. Is that what it, the text literally say, three? That's your homework. I want you to go back. And, 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 and tell me how many wise men it was. It just described the three gifts. But our cultural practice says there was three wise men. But the Bible say it probably was about a thousand of them. <laughs> no, the Bible don't say that, but it don't say how many it was. But we assume by the three gifts. That's reading into the scripture something that is not even there. That's not even interpreting literally. And people do that. That's called allegorizing. The Catholic, that's how they interpret the Bible. They allegorize it. In other words, they say Esther means the church. Haman means the devil. And Mordecai is the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is going to use the church to save the world <laughs> to save the Jews that's allegorizing and so they ignore that these were actually literally historical people that actually existed they'll take a, a, a period and say oh that period means something you know they won't take it literally we got to get out of that habit I want to close with something go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. 
The first step to reverting back to your old unbelieving lifestyle is when you neglect and start rejecting what the word of God clearly teaches. The first step to going back to the old life is when we reject and neglect what the word of God teach. And Paul here in Ephesians 4 verse 17 warn these believers about neglecting God's word or rejecting God's word, it lead to reversionism. It leads to abandoning God and returning to the old unbelieving lifestyle. And I wanna just share this with you, start at verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk, that you live no longer. Word walk is a Greek word, peripateo, it means to live, that you live no longer, which tells you that these believers, Ephesian believers, used to live like he's telling them not to live. That you live no longer just as. The word just as carried the idea of imitating somebody. That you no longer walk just as the Gentile also live in the emptiness of their minds. The Gentile or unbelievers, they live their life in the emptiness of their mind. Now, why is unbelievers' mind or thinking empty? Because they have rejected God's truth. And once they reject God's truth, they have nothing to measure right and wrong. They just pretty much do what they think is right. They believe whatever they want to believe because they don't have God's truth. Why is he wanting the believer? Because he, he wanted the believer about living like unbelievers. And believers live like unbelievers when they would not accept God's word, when they neglect it, when they reject it. Then he said in verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding and they're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. And they have given themselves, and they have become callous and have given themselves over to sensuality for they practice every kind of impurity with greed in it. So he's showing how the unbeliever declined morally. They, they first start, they reject the gospel, they reject God's word. And once they reject God's word, then their understanding become dark. And once their understanding is dark, they're separated from the life of God. They become ignorant. And when they become ignorant through rejecting God's word, their heart become harder and harder. The more a person reject God's word and disregard God's word, his heart become harder and harder and harder to the point where they're no longer sensitive to God's conviction, no longer sensitive to sin. And what happens when a person is not sensitive? They just abandon themselves to that lifestyle that they're not sensitive to. And that's what happened. But he warned believers. Well, he's trying to tell believers that if you neglect and reject God's word, you're going to be darkened in your understanding. You're going to be separated from the spiritual life. You're going to become ignorant. In other words, your soul become like a vacuum cleaner. When our souls are empty of God's word, our soul is not designed to be empty. Our thinking is not designed to be empty. But if I'm not taking in God's word and accepting God's word and believing it, then my soul become a vacuum cleaner. In other words, it's going to suck up all the trash around it all the human viewpoint thinking, all the worldly thinking. And then before you know it, I'm ignorant. And my heart become harder and harder the more I reject God's word. And then the more I reject God's word, I'm no longer sensitive or feel convicted. It's like I can sin and just think it's okay and not even feel convicted by it because my heart is not hardened. But in that decline, God is sending things in our life called discipline to show us that hey you, you, your your heart is becoming harder and harder come back come back either we can respond and humble ourselves confess our rebellion our disobedience and our negativity toward god's word or we can just continue down that path and then god have to intensify the discipline and it goes to intensive discipline and then when we just have abandoned ourselves to a lifestyle of sin and rebellion then god said you know what you're supposed to be a light of the world. Come on home. 
and he'll call us on home prematurely. And I know that don't sound like a loving God, but it does. Why would he allow us to stay here on earth, ruin our life, be drugged in the mud by Satan, and you're his child? He's not going to sit back and watch that because he loves you. So he'll say, hey, come on home. Come on home. But the believers who are positive toward God's word, learning the word of God, growing the word in the word of God, they enjoy the spiritual life, and God used them in the world, and they tend to have a longer life than some believers. So my point here is that God's word has the final authority. Never become negative to God's word when it do what it's supposed to do. It's going to show you that your beliefs may be wrong. Your behavior may be wrong. Uh, uh, and, and But humble yourself. Because if you become negative, you're acting like an unsafe person. Let us not become negative, but let's stay positive. And as you stay positive and patient with the word, God's going to make everything clear to you. Something you may not understand, you may not see how it all works, but if you be patient, God's going to make everything all clear. But never be negative because then we're, we're going to decline and go back to our old lifestyle. And that is full with discipline from God. And God don't want that for us. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful for all you have done for us in grace. We ask of you, Lord, to help us to maintain the proper attitude for taking in your word. We ask that you would make all things understandable and help us remain positive so that we would not revert back to our old unbelieving lifestyle. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen.